What wonderful words. Do please sit down, everybody, and let me ask you to reach for a Bible and turn to page 801. You should find Malachi chapter 2 there if you're in your own Bible. If we've not met, my name is Paul. It's great to be able to welcome you this morning. We've been working our way through Malachi. We're going to keep doing it for the next few weeks. We come to chapter 2, verses 1 to 9 this morning before we share the Lord's Supper together. I'm going to lead us in prayer, ask for God's help as we read his word. It's the only way anything of any significant value will happen among us this morning is if God works to give us understanding and make our hearts receptive, our wills obedient to his word. So we'll depend on him together and then I'll read uh, God's word to us. Our Father, we thank you indeed for your presence with us. And we acknowledge our complete dependence upon you, not just for life and breath, but for spiritual life that comes by your spirit and through your word. We pray, therefore, that you would uh, work to give us good understanding, attentive hearts and minds, and that you might transform us by your spirit so that everything that we are as individuals and as a community might be pleasing in your sight. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to us then Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. God says, And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction." Challenging words. I hope you'll keep them open in front of you. There's also uh, an outline of where we're heading on the back of the notice sheet that will keep you uh, right, I hope. Um, Our subject, you'll have gathered, I guess, even from the reading this morning, is the teaching of God's Word. Um, It's something that's pretty close to my own heart for obvious reasons. I I hope we're going to see why it should be of first importance for all of God's people and not just Uh, The guy standing at the front, Psalm 19, says that God's word itself is perfect and pure and firm and righteous and trustworthy and radiant. Isaiah says, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Psalmist again, God's word refreshes the soul, It makes wise the simple, it gives joy to the heart and light to the eyes. The New Testament adds that it teaches and rebukes and corrects and trains us in righteousness. So like a sword, God's word penetrates our heart. Like a a hammer, it, it can break the hardness and the callous around our hearts. Like a lamp, it directs our path. Like a spotlight, it trains our focus upon the Lord Jesus himself. As such, God's word is precious, uh, more precious than much pure gold, sweeter than honey from the comb. And so God's people love his word. We delight in it. We meditate on it day and night, say the scriptures. We crave it in the way that a baby craves its mother's milk, not as an end in itself, but so that we can know God in it and walk in his ways. 
And God's word is powerful. Like the rain that falls from heaven, it never returns to the Lord empty, but accomplishes his will. It's through his word that God works to reveal himself to us. Do you want to know God? You will meet him in his word. It's through his word that he gives life by his spirit. It's through his word that he grows us up in salvation. And therefore, the the faithful teaching of God's word must really matter. God's word can't be twisted or distorted or added to or subtracted from. God calls that shameful. Uh, God's word must be guarded. The Bible says rightly divided, taught, preached, proclaimed, set forth humbly and plainly and to the glory of God. And God delights in the right teaching of his word. And we'll see it's not an exaggeration to say that he detests it. If his messengers set his word to one side or tell itching ears what they want to hear or speak a word of their own invention in place of his true and living word. So the teaching of of God's word is of first importance. That's really the, the heart of what God is saying to us this morning. And he makes the point through a a contrast between the way that he wanted things to be happening in Israel and the way that they actually were in Malachi's day. And the passage is put together like a little sandwich. You get the ideal in the middle and then the reality on either side. And I thought we'd look at the meat first or the lettuce, whatever it is you like in your sandwich, and then we'll come out to the bread afterwards. So two headings, you'll see them on the sheet. First, the godly pattern of true instruction, the godly pattern of true instruction. Let me read verses five to seven. Again, God says, my covenant with Levi was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. He feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge And people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Uh, You'll see mention of that that covenant with Levi in verse 4 and verse 8 as well. Back in Numbers, God set apart the whole of the tribe of Levi to work for him, and uh, one particular clan, the Aaronites, to serve as his priests. In simplest term, their job was to be middlemen between men and God, two sides to it. So they represented people to God by making offerings on their behalf, by praying for them, and they represented God to people by teaching his word to them. And this is their job description in Deuteronomy. They shall teach Jacob your rules, Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and hold burnt offerings on your altar. Here in Malachi... Both bits of that, the offerings, that was terrible. We saw that last week, roadkill sacrifices. Now he turns on their teaching. But in these middle verses, he explains the teaching job that they should have been doing. And you'll see I've put four M's on the sheet, and some of them are a stretch for which I can only apologize. But we start with the first M, which is the man himself. Uh, Because all through the the Bible, who the, the teacher or preacher is, as a man of God, matters every bit as much as the content of their teaching. So verse 5 calls this a covenant of fear. This uh, priest was to fear God, to stand in awe of him. It can't be just a job, not a nine-to-five thing. This role is an expression of who they are on the inside. The thing that was to define them was this reverent and awe-filled humility that honored God as God. And that inner fear will then shape the rest of his life. Verse 6 says, he he walked with me in peace and uprightness. They don't just talk the talk, but like Enoch, Noah, Abraham, they would walk with God. They would pursue a life of quiet godliness. Um, Reminds me of the Apostle Paul saying to people, you know how I lived among you. I was there for a couple of years. You saw me up close and personal, and you know that my life marked me out as a consistent and true teacher of God's word. To Timothy, he says, set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And that priority of godliness in any teacher of God's word, any leader among God's people in the New Testament has its origin here 
in the role of the priest. The second M is his message. Go on to verse 6 again. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. He turned many from iniquity. The lips of a priest should guard knowledge. People should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Now, we know that messengers have only one job. They're entrusted with a message, and their job is to deliver it faithfully. Uh, that's all that they ever have to do. So the priest in verse 7 guards knowledge. Uh, you, you think of a soldier or a policeman standing on guard to protect something precious, um, and God has revealed himself truthfully in his word. He's given every, us everything we need to come to know him, to live in a right relationship with him, and so the, the teacher guards that knowledge by passing it on faithfully, by proclaiming it to others. It's never a teacher's job to be innovative, uh, to come up with a new message in a new generation. It's not their job to be selective, to stand in judgment over God's Word and decide which bits are acceptable today. They have no right to twist or to distort the message. That Their only job is to pass on what God has said. All of the riches of the whole counsel of God in all of its fullness, all of the right proportions and according to the needs of of the people. Just um, stop with me for a second again on why that matters so much. So if God's Word is where He reveals Himself, then if a teacher is to, to twist God's Word, necessarily he's presenting people with a distorted picture of who God is. If God's Word is how He saves people, then if a teacher abandons God's word and preaches a different message, he's denying their hearer the chance of salvation. And if God's word is how he grows people, then if a teacher's an unreliable messenger, they are consigning their hearers at best to a lifetime of spiritual malnutrition and stunted growth and missing out on the, the joy of an intimate relationship with the Lord. Our third M is becoming more tenuous. Uh, it reminds us again how high the stakes are. The end of verse 6 says that when a priest does that job properly, he turned many from iniquity. That's the, the goal here. So in, in Genesis, sin is described at crouching at the door, looking to have mastery over us. Peter will talk in the New Testament about the, the sinful desires we have that wage war against our soul. And God wants to guard his people against sin. And one of the key ways that he does it is through the teaching of his word. So a commentator here compares the job of the priest to a lighthouse, the means by which light shines out from God's word and turns people away from the destruction on the rocks of sin. I don't know about you, I sometimes wonder where I would be if God hadn't put in my life people who would teach me the truth of his word when I needed to hear it. And the answer is shipwrecked. In that way, most tenuous of all, fourth final M, the priest was a means of God's blessing. Uh, their job wasn't a hobby. Look at verse 5. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. I gave them to him. Life there means something like the joy of life. It means life in its fullness. And peace is shalom, its wholeness. And God in his grace first gave those blessings directly to the priests themselves to enjoy, but then used them to extend his blessing to others as well. They would pronounce God's blessing. Famously, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. And that blessing was the means by which God poured out his goodness in people's lives. So just a brief survey. But I hope it shows how the work of the priests was essential, not arbitrary, to the, the wholeness of God's people and to their knowledge of, their enjoyment of God, their walk with him. 
Not because there was anything special about the priests themselves. They were sinners like the rest of us. But God had set it up in such a way that he was doing his work through them. And when it was good, it was great. But in Malachi's time, it was terrible. So second major heading, the cursed reality of corrupt teaching. And I'll read both bits of bread. Start one to three and then seven to nine. Now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I've already cursed them because you don't lay it to heart. Behold, I'll rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. On to verse 7. The lips of a priest should guard knowledge. People should seek instruction from his mouth. He's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you don't keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Well, it's not a terrific report card, is it? Uh, in life, the priests weren't walking in righteousness. Verse 8, they turned aside from the way. In their ministry, they weren't guarding knowledge. Verse 9, they'd failed to keep his ways. Maybe worst of all, instead of turning many from iniquity, verse 8, they were causing many to stumble by their instruction. That stumbling word is especially loaded when Isaiah was describing the sins of Jerusalem before the exile. He said that they were stumbling. And so God's saying, you, you priests, it's like you're trying to put my people back into exile. That's how terrible you are. Uh, the summary is at the end of verse 8. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, that corrupted word, when something is so damaged that it's been rendered useless. In chapter 1, the dodgy sacrifices were corrupt. And that's exactly what the priests were doing. You've rendered my covenant useless, says God. You've, you've blocked the channel of my blessing to my people. Uh, a friend of mine was struggling with a moral issue. Uh, for him, it was in the area of human sexuality. He knew he needed help, so he went to see his minister. And instead of teaching him God's word in a, in a gracious and gentle and loving way, the minister said to him, you do not need to worry about what the Bible says anymore. God just wants you to be happy. Pretty much a direct quote. And so he caused my friend to stumble by his instruction. Another friend had a theological issue. He was struggling with the idea that Jesus claims to be the only way to God. And so he was very relieved to find teachers who claimed to believe the Bible but who said that as long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what you believe, because God will save you in the end. And so by not guarding knowledge, those teachers caused my friend to turn aside from God's revealed truth. And some would say, well, does it really matter all that much? Surely what matters is that we're good, kind people. That's what, so what if someone wants to pick and choose which bits of an ancient text they believe or teach or obey? By way of application, uh, first, a warning to teachers of God's word. Um, this was the primary application to the priests themselves as Malachi spoke. Verse 1, now a priest, this command is for you. Command has the sense of warning. Uh, verse 4 again, so you shall know that I have sent this warning to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. And the, the warning itself is sandwiched in between. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart and give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts. That is, if you won't stop uh, corrupting my covenant, if you won't repent of that, then you will be cursed says God to these priests. 
tenses are maybe a bit confusing. Um, in the next couple of verbs, it's in the future. I will send the curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Then they switch. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you don't lay it to heart. Then it's back to the future in verse 3, the present in verse 9. I think it's simpler than it, it looks. God has pronounced his curse on their corruption. The, the priests, the people are starting to feel its ill effects. And if they refuse to listen, things will get even worse. But for now, because God is the God of love, here is one last chance. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. If they don't, the disaster that's coming is truly terrible. God says, I will curse your blessings. Uh, for you, priests, personally, I seems to be saying, I'll, I'll plague the even the best and the happiest bits of your life with trouble. But even professionally as well, when you're up front pronouncing my blessing, really all you'll be doing is spreading my curse. And look how seriously God means it in verse 3. I will spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. Can you imagine the God of love saying that, being so exercised by something that he says that. The, the dung word refers to everything that was left behind when an animal was slaughtered, um, not just excrement, but all of its innards as well. And uh, Leviticus said all of that stuff had to be gathered up and burnt outside of the camp because it was so defiled and so unclean. And now God says to these priests who are priding themselves on their high social status and their access to the temple, I'm going to get all of that offal and filth and smear your faces in it and then get you carried outside of the city and leave you despised and abased before the people as a picture of how disgusting you've become in my sight for the job that you're doing, says the Lord of hosts. And verse 3 has a sense of imminence about it. I'm on the verge of doing this. But, but once again, God's own moral desire is different. What he wants to do in verse 4 is not to curse. What he wants to do is to preserve his covenant. Uh, that's why he's speaking through Malachi, it's another gift of God's grace. He wants to summon these people back to the job that they should have been doing all along. What of us? Well, the, the New Testament church minister, the, the preacher, isn't in exactly the same role as the priest in the Old Testament. There isn't a, a covenant with Bible teachers today in exactly the same sort of way. But the, the character qualifications, and at least this aspect of their job description is very similar. So this warning does give us a very clear sense of what God would say to anyone who presumes to instruct others in God's name, but whose life or doctrine is falling short. Someone comes under some kind of conviction. They're worried about what will happen to them when they die. Wouldn't it be wonderful if across Scotland, whichever church they happen to walk into, on whichever corner of whichever street of whichever city, they met someone who would gently and graciously and lovingly explain to them that Jesus had conquered death and that if we trust in him, even though we die, we'll live forevermore. Instead, many a time, this happened to someone I know You've no need to worry. You are baptized. You die. You just go to a better place. Peace be upon you when there is no peace. Another church leader deliberately sets aside the authority of the scriptures and teaches a congregation a morality that flatly contradicts it. A general synod or a general assembly enshrines that sort of teaching in its church's canons. And the world says the church is keeping up with the times. And the church pats itself on the back and says, we're so glad you approve of us. 
And God says, I will spread dung on your faces and you will be cursed and despised and abased. Uh, in the New Testament, James, the brother of Jesus, says, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So if someone here is a teacher of God's word, um, either you're a church leader, I, I guess like I am, or one of our elders, or you, you teach God's word informally as a church member, either here or in any other context, and if in life or doctrine any of us has already departed from God's biblical pattern of ministry, then we please need to heed this gracious warning from God while we can. We all fall short. Today's a good day to come back to God, to confess our sins, and to claim his forgiveness afresh. Jesus said that the, the Pharisees, by their teaching, uh, who were pretty similar, made their followers twice as much a child of hell as they already were. It's that serious. But God says, return to me, and I will return to you. Maybe you're a teacher of God's word, or you want to be in the future, and you, you are one who is not complacent about these things, but you are battling for faithfulness in your life and in the truth, in the teaching that you pass on. An encouragement, I hope, to remember to keep a close watch on your life and your doctrine. Paul says, persist in this, for by so doing, you will save yourself and your hearers. That battle for faithfulness is worth it, so keep going. Or maybe you look at the wider church, you wonder, how is it that all over the world, false teachers twist and flatly deny God's word and get away with it? Where is the God of justice? Will he not do something? I hope we're reminded that God really does care about the teaching of his word, and one day he will rise in judgment. And so we want to encourage false teachers to come back to him today while they still can. That's the warning. It is pretty sober, isn't it? But I'm keen for us to end with worship of the perfect priest, and especially as we come to the Lord's table. Let me read verse 6 once again, but with a, a minor tweak to make the point. True instruction was in Jesus' mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. Jesus walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. The lips of Jesus guarded knowledge perfectly, and you should therefore seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the ultimate messenger of the Lord of hosts. Once again, we can't read Malachi without thinking of our Lord Jesus. As a man, Peter said of him, he committed no sin, Neither was any deceit found in his mouth. His message was flawless. Um, one particular sin of these priests was showing per partiality. Verse 9 says they were allowing the rich to get away with oppressing the poor. In Luke 20, the spies of the chief priests say to Jesus, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Because Jesus alone came from heaven, Jesus alone knew, knows God perfectly. Jesus was filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit so that as the Apostle John could put it, when he speaks, he utters the very words of God. So we are right to worship Jesus, the perfect prophet, priest, and king. We're right to, as it's put here, to seek instruction from his mouth. God says of Jesus, do you remember, this is my son, listen to him. And I say all this because I know that when we open the Bible sometimes, it, it can feel dry to us, it can feel as though God is distant. I know that the idea of coming to church sometimes can feel too much like effort, 
Uh, I know that the preacher, especially this one, isn't as thrilling as your favorite YouTuber. But the words of Jesus are perfect and pure and firm and trustworthy and righteous and radiant. And the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the words of Jesus will endure forever. And they alone can refresh the soul and make you wise and give joy to the heart and light to the eyes because Jesus is the true messenger of the Lord. So I take it we want to leave today wanting to be, do you remember Mary in Luke 10? Not distracted and anxious and troubled by many things, even service, but sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to his word. That's our great privilege. Whenever we open the Bible by ourselves, whenever we gather in small groups, whenever we come and sit under God's word together on a Sunday. Uh, the teaching of God's word is not an arbitrary thing. It can and should never be thought of as just the pet emphasis of one church or another, as though it's okay to have a different one. It is of first importance for all of God's people because it's through his word that God works to reveal himself, to save, to grow his people. And so we pay close attention to his word together. Let me lead us in prayer. Oh, Father, we do want to praise you that you are a God who has chosen to reveal yourself, um, that you haven't left us in the dark about who you are or the work that you're doing in the world and that you haven't left us powerless to try and work you out by ourselves or to try and come to know you by our own effort or to grow to be like you just because we try hard. We thank you that you have provided your word through which you reveal yourself and save and grow your people to maturity in the Lord Jesus. Therefore, we are sorry for times uh, maybe seasons of our life in which we've not listened to your word as we should. We've not sought instruction from the lips of your son. We've thought that we know better. Or we've just thought we can't be bothered. And so we've drifted and listened to ourselves and to our world. We see that attitude in, enshrined in, with great sadness in many churches and so we want to pray for our land and to pray for ourselves. Uh, please show us ways in which we are falling short of giving a right attention to you and your word, listening to your son. Pray for teachers of your word in our church family, whether they're teaching kids or youth or students or grown-ups in whatever capacity. We pray very much that life and doctrine would honor you. And we pray for our land and ask you to have mercy on teachers who have departed from your truth, on local churches and denominations who have done that. Please bring them to repentance and cause them to return to you while they still can. Thank you for this gracious warning of just how seriously you take it, we pray it would be heeded. And we pray that you would raise up from our own congregation and up and down Scotland and around the world, many, many who will point people faithfully to the Lord Jesus by proclaiming his word, by loving them, and by teaching faithfully and living faithfully. And we pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.